Hello, welcome to RPM News Weekly, a roundup of important automotive news that goes behind the headlines. I'm your host, Rich Tabor. This week, RPM News Weekly kicks off its second season of programming and the launch of its all new website at rpmnewsweekly.com with a visit to the Lars Anderson Auto Museum in Brookline, Massachusetts, where Boston Museum of Fine Arts Curator of Design, Megan Melvin, gave a group of curious automotive enthusiasts a peek at the MFA's transportation design collection. Don't worry, it's not as stuffy as you might think. In fact, we were delightfully surprised that the museum has such an expansive collection of original automobile design artwork from such highly regarded automotive illustrators as Kyle Renner, Homer C. Legacy, Wayne Cady, Kyle Moravik, and Richard Abib. So stay with us for the following highlights from the presentation. Um, 
So I'm just going to show you two works by, by Ted Keach. This. So this was 43, yeah, 1950, the Meteor Proposal, and here a bathtub uh, match sedan from 43. Yeah, so Ted Peach II, he exhibited a single-minded interest in cars from a very young age. He was a talented draftsman. He was employed by Chrysler at the age of 22 and was able to realize his dream of becoming a professional car designer when in 1934 he was asked to work on the Star Car. And over the course of his unusually peripatetic career, spanning the golden years of American car design and innovation, he worked for Hudson Motor Car Company, Briggs Manufacturing, Ford, Raymond Lowy Associates, and American Motors. So in his case, we have about a hundred of drawings by him. We also have sort of one-off designs. This is uh, the design for the American Bantam double-sided Jeep. This is by uh, the industrial designer Alexis de, uh, de Sarkinovsky. Military, uh, military history happens to be another area of Mr. Sharp's collecting interests. But in terms of car design, that is not a focus of what we have at the MFA. I would describe it largely as, as sort of commercial, personal vehicles. But did want to show you that we do have a small military component. We have a, I don't have exact numbers for you because again, it's always growing. We have works by Homer Legacy, who may be familiar to some of you. I'll show you a couple. <laughs> so so Legacy joined uh, General Motors in 1942 after graduating from Pratt. And he became the youngest stylist hired by the company at 22. Um, um, some of his contributions were to the Buick Wildcat and um, also the Pontiac Bonneville Special. About, he worked there for about 10 years and he moved to Chrysler to become the chief designer of the Dodge and Suburban Studios. Then after Chrysler, he went out on his own and he moved on to, the, uh, to Ford in 61. And he did exteriors for the Mustang, the Maverick, Falcon, Fairlane, and Thunderbird, to name but a few. Um, he did all sorts of other things like I could spend a whole. He did things like this here, um, Buick Century lettering. Um, I'm trying to think what else he did. Um, and another vital aspect of his legacy was his teaching career at the Center for Creative Studies and his significant role in building the transportation design program. And now it's, um, you know, much of the material we have is mid century or before. Here's some more hubcaps. And again, some of these drawings are they're really big, big and bold, and gleam, um, jumping off the page. Um, we also have a number of works by uh, Wayne Cady, who started off in the early 60s. Um, he spent most of his career with Cadillac and Buick. Again, we have um, a large, uh, or I bet we have at least 20 or more works by him. But generally speaking, so this is something, this is a design from 64. Uh, most of the material is pre-60s, but there is material from um, the 70s and 80s. And uh, some of my favorite drawings, I know, like parents were not supposed to talk about, or really not supposed to have favorites. I just, I love them all, just differently. Um, um, a lot of the concept sketches by the great uh, GM dream car designer, Carl Renner. And again, we, at the moment, we have about, I want to say, we certainly have over 50 at the museum. Here's just a selection. So, should be convertible. <coughs> they have such dynamism, they sort of want to zoom off the page. And, but here again, you can see, these are on tracing paper, the raggedy edges. These were executed in high, high numbers. Um, you know, probably were pinned up on a board, you know, were torn down, many of them probably thrown away. Uh, in many ways, it's amazing how many have survived. This is LaSalle Roadster. Um, oh, there we go. All right. So, I invite questions or, I don't know. Yeah. When you mentioned the arc of the career of one of or any of the artists, mm -hmm. do we have uh, much information on where they studied before they became um, 
uh, artists for any of the manufacturers? It, it really depends, and I have to say, and Sheldon, you may want to speak to that too, so actually Mr. Sharp has done a huge amount of research when possible. So the, again, this is the, not the type of material that you can readily find. There's no one single resource. So when he did acquire them from the designer or the designer's descendants directly, he made a real effort to interview people. He would interview the, the artists, and that's where you find the information. And thanks to the internet now and all the wonderful the, the, the chat rooms and the sites devoted to you know, whichever model or car or firm that you're particularly interested in, you can find that information because often it's the designers and maybe some of you in the audience themselves, people are sharing that information online, but it's, it's not easy to find and a lot of it is lost. Um, I do have, I'm going to bend down just for a second, Mr. Sharp, uh, the other thing he did with all the drawings, and again, some of you may have seen some of this material here at the Los Anderson, there have been shows, Mr. Sharp made uh, publications like these, little, any of, any of the information that he could find, he would put out in these publications. I brought my own copies, and I'm happy just to show them to you, so again, we have these at the museum. Um, so that's how we find the information, but it's, it's pretty haphazard. Sometimes we, there is no more information, but in the case of them here that we have at the museum, thanks to Mr. Sharp's diligence, we actually do have a fair amount of background info. Uh, the automobile is, is so intrinsic to our culture for the last hundred years. There's so many artifacts, you know, whether it's just a small little ring that went around a, a small light bulb, um, you know, or something as large as the vehicle itself. Mm -hmm. And do you, how do you dif differentiate about, you know, when you're searching for something for the collection, mm -hmm. do you have certain parameters where you're not just collecting anything that's, let's say, automobile related, or are you looking for certain types of art? So this is a, a, a broader question, not just related to this, about the, how the NFA collects. So yes, the, we do the museums, and all, most of you, I think all museums have collecting strategies. So you assess what you have, and then you develop a strategy where you want to go. So we prioritize certain things, and those, that can be driven by different factors. So one would be, oh, we're going to do an ex in five years, we're going to do an exhibition of this group of artists. Oh, we only have works by four of the five. Our collecting priority is now we really need to fill in and get works from artist number five. And that could be through acquisition, something that comes to the museum permanently, or maybe we'll borrow it, we'll find the people who might have that material. So sometimes it can get very, very specific, and in other cases it can be uh, more general. So in this case, it might be through a fortunate circumstance, we have this wonderful, enormous collection of transportation design, but it might be so something like this, that it came my way realizing that. But we also have, we want to expand our collection of graphic design and advertising at the museum. Maybe we can try to make a connection between those. So sometimes it's um, luck and fortune, but there often is, and, and these are written documents that in the case of the MFA, we review every three years and sort of try to prioritize what we're going to go after. But you always have to be flexible and open to opportunities if something extraordinary comes your way. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so in a general way. So if someone came in with a box of hood ornaments, you may not really necessarily want that for your collection because some of them might be commonplace right. versus others that might be very rare. Exactly. Yeah, and it, do we have any hood ornaments? Or maybe we just want the drawings of the hood ornaments. Um, RPM News Weekly would like to thank the Lars Anderson Auto Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and especially Megan Melvin for the opportunity to share these highlights with you. We hope that it inspires you to find out more about these automotive artists and encourages you to visit both the Lars Anderson Auto Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Thank you for watching. Tune in next week for another edition of RPM News Weekly.